There are reports of several people injured. More than a dozen are being rushed to the hospital. And there is also word fires were set within the facility. Schools in the area had been placed on lockdown. Buses carrying children home brought back to school. And there are reports at least one inmate is unaccounted for. There is a manhunt tonight. ABC's Gio Benitez leading us off. Chaos at a prison in North Carolina. Police responding to an attempted prison break. We do have a mass casualty incident. I have multiple patients. Some of them are critical. North Carolina Public Safety saying a fire was set at the Pasquotank Correctional Institute's sewing plant around 3.30 this afternoon. An officer uh, struck multiple times with a hammer, unresponsive at this time, working on IV access. Uh, significant bruising and bleeding. At least nine people rushed to the hospital and more expected. I'm going to have several walking wounded. We need to clear some beds. Tonight, we don't yet know the condition of those injured or how many were prison employees. Yeah, I've got ambulances inbound. Please start setting up some sort of triage and mass casualty within the facility. For a time, at least three schools were put on lockdown and students who were already on a school bus were sent back to those schools. Tonight, local police tell ABC affiliate WVEC they are searching the nearby woods for one inmate who is not accounted for. And David, Pascotank is a massive prison with more than 700 prisoners. They also have an electronic security fence intended to prevent escapes. David? Gio Benita is leading us off. Gio, thank you. And now to the devastating and deadly wildfires in California. California's fire chief tonight now warning it's going to get worse before it gets better. Fierce fires burning in the hills of Napa County. Strong Diablo winds ramping up today. Thousands forced from their homes. The entire city of Calistoga, 5,000 people ordered to evacuate. And you can see right there the lines of traffic on the one road out. And now comes word two fires have combined as one. ABC's Lindsay Janice is in Santa Rosa. Tonight, DC 10s and this 747 super tanker, part of the all out effort to contain what could become the deadliest and most destructive wildfires in California history. We are not out of this emergency. We're not even close to being out of this emergency. This team from San Francisco in a hand to hand, house to house battle. On the front lines, firefighters dealing with thick smoke and rough terrain. So this fire is about to jump this road here up this hillside. There is a significant potential for that. And if you look at the fuels, they're very, very dry. More than two dozen now dead, hundreds missing. Authorities now using cadaver dogs to find victims. We have found bodies that were almost completely intact. And we have found bodies that were nothing more than ash and bones. Winds gusting up to 45 miles an hour could erase any progress they hope to make against fires that have already burned more than 250 square miles. And a number of these fires as they grow are, are actually growing uh, together. Entire cities evacuated. In Calistoga, police going door to door and patrolling streets. Roads choked with cars. Folks are being smart. Get out while you can. In Sonoma, a race to pack up. And I built 30 years of my business and I'm not letting a fire take it. We're going to clear everything out as much as we can. And tonight, new questions about how authorities warned residents about the fires. Local authorities have the responsibility of pushing out uh, messaging for um, uh, evacuation orders. Sonoma County reportedly considered but did not use the wireless emergency alert system because it worried it could create panic and hinder rescuers. And Lindsay Janice joins us live from Santa Rosa. And Lindsay, you told us that staggering number, 3,500 homes and businesses destroyed by this fire. And you're where a school once stood? That's right, David. Take a look at this. This was a Catholic high school. The mangled metal you see there, school desks. And this fire extinguisher exploded by the flames. Of those 3,500 structures you mentioned destroyed by these fires, more than 2,800 of them right here in Santa Rosa. Just incredible devastation. Yeah, David? Stunning scene there. Lindsay, our thanks to you. Let's get right to Rob because we all heard the fire chief say that this could get worse before it gets better there. <laughs> Looking at these winds tonight, Rob. And they're going to crank up again tomorrow, David. We've got about 18 hours, though, of relative calm tonight for them to get, try to get things under control. But red flag warnings, look at that. And the fire weather watches for a huge chunk of California, especially Southern California, where tomorrow conditions will be critical. Offshore winds will pick up tomorrow right through Saturday. Humidity levels are going to be dropping. This weekend will be difficult again, David. All right, Rob Marciano with us again tonight. Thank you, Rob. Next tonight, President Trump and his chief of staff, General John Kelly. Today, a very rare moment. Amid reports of growing tension between the two, the chief of staff suddenly walking into the White House briefing room and he took questions about his relationship with President Trump. Here's ABC's chief White House correspondent, Jonathan Carl. 
Chief of Staff John Kelly today firmly denied reports that he's so fed up with his job he wants to quit. Although I read it all the time, uh, pretty consistently, I, I'm not quitting today. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't believe, and I just talked to the president, I don't think I'm being fired today. Um, and uh, I am not so frustrated in this job that uh, I'm thinking of leaving. It's the first time Kelly has taken questions from the White House press corps since becoming the ultimate behind-the-scenes power player. Do his tweets make your job more difficult, General Kelly? No. Kelly said his job responsibilities do not include managing the president's Twitter feed. I was not sent into or brought in to control him. Amid widespread reports of dysfunction and discord in the West Wing, the president has come forward in recent days to praise Kelly's leadership. He loves doing this, which is chief of staff more than anything he's ever done. The retired Marine puts it this way. This is the hardest job I've ever had. This is, in my view, the most important job I ever had. Uh, I would offer, though, it is not the best job I ever had. Best job I ever had, as I've said many times, is when I was an enlisted Marine sergeant infantryman. That was the best job I ever had. Jonathan Carl with us live at the White House tonight. And John, the chief of staff was also asked about the executive order signed today by President Trump that potentially clears the way for sweeping changes in health insurance, John. Potentially, David, what it does, it triggers a review of changes that would allow insurance companies to offer stripped down insurance policies. Those would mean lower premiums for people that get those stripped down plans, but healthcare experts warn that such plans could offer no coverage for basic services like maternity care, prescription drugs, and even ambulance services. David? So certainly a lot of debate to come on this. John Carr, thanks to you. The president also tweeting today a warning aimed at Puerto Rico that FEMA can't be there forever. So what's to come for the nearly three and a half million American citizens who live there? Here's ABC senior White House correspondent Cecilia Vega on that. From President Trump today, a dire warning that federal aid to Puerto Rico may disappear. The president tweeting, we cannot keep FEMA, the military, and the first responders in PR forever. He's been under fire. We love Puerto Rico. For his response to Hurricane Maria, throwing paper towels to storm victims during his visit, and bashing the island for its massive debt. But just days ago, a change of tone, the president making this promise. We will not rest until that job is done. Today, Democrats lashed out at that new presidential warning. Mr. President, do not send a message to any American that we will turn our backs on them. That is not fair, it's not right, and you ought to correct the statement you made Gentlemen's this out of order. Even the island's governor, an ally of the president's, tweeting, the U.S. citizens in Puerto Rico are requesting the support that any of our fellow citizens would receive across our nation. Three weeks after the storm, there are nearly 17,000 FEMA workers in Puerto Rico, but there are also nearly 4,000 in Texas seven weeks after Hurricane Harvey and nearly 3,000 in Florida five weeks after Irma. Does President Trump believe that the people of Puerto Rico are American citizens yes. who deserve the same access to federal aid as the people who live in Texas and Florida? Yes. What is his tweet about then? Our country will stand with those American citizens in Puerto Rico until the job is done. But they're not going to be there forever. Cecilia Vega with us live from the White House. And Cecilia, after that warning that FEMA can't be in Puerto Rico forever from the president today, you learned that FEMA workers spend years helping Americans rebuild. In fact, they're still working on the recovery efforts after Hurricane Katrina 12 years ago. They are, David. FEMA tells us about 165 FEMA workers still on the ground there in Louisiana. But despite the president's Trump's today, you heard General, the president's tweets today, rather, you heard General Kelly uh, there in the briefing room say that this White House is committed to helping Puerto Rico. And David, today the House approved a disaster relief request from this White House, $365 billion. The Senate, David, is expected to vote on this next week. Cecilia Vega with us tonight as well. Thank you, Cecilia. We turn next year to the sudden release of a family kidnapped by the Taliban, an American mother, her husband, and her three young children. And we've just learned tonight that they are heading back, but not to the U.S. Here's ABC's chief investigative correspondent, Brian Ross. They were America's littlest hostages, and tonight they and their parents, American Caitlin Coleman and Canadian Joshua Boyle, are free after five years of captivity. I am prisoner of the Taliban. 
Coleman was seven months pregnant when she and her husband were kidnapped while on a hiking vacation in Afghanistan. The Taliban threatened to execute them. They are willing to kill us, willing to kill women, to kill children, to kill whomever. Hostage videos over the years showed their plight worsening as she gave birth to three children. My children have seen their mother defile. And the ordeal took its toll on her parents, Linda and Jim Coleman, in Stewartstown, Pennsylvania. I'm not sure I'm ever going to see her again. I'm not sure I'm ever going to see my grandchildren. So it's gotten very, very difficult. The Pakistani military launched its top secret mission Wednesday in a mountainous area near the Afghanistan border, saying it was acting on U.S. intelligence information. And even before the hostages were in U.S. hands, President Trump made a cryptic reference to the mission. And something happened today where a country that totally disrespected us called with some very, very important news. The president has accused Pakistan of giving safe haven to terrorists, but today he thanked them. Right now, a lot of countries are starting to respect the United States of America once again. And Brian Ross with us here tonight. And Brian, you learned that this family is headed back to Canada, not the U.S. Yes, David, American officials say the husband refused to board an American military aircraft or to allow U.S. medical personnel to examine his children. And Caitlin Coleman's father tells me tonight his daughter and her family are indeed planning to go to Canada. He says he can't understand why they're doing that after all the U.S. did, David, to get them free. All right, Brian Ross tonight. Brian, thank you. Next here to that developing headline from Las Vegas. Tonight, the hotel now revealing its own timeline involving that hero security officer who was shot and who then called for help and the massacre. ABC senior national correspondent Matt Gutman back in Las Vegas. Tonight, the owners of the Mandalay Bay out with a new timeline of what they say happened the night of the massacre. The company disputing what police have said and insists there was no six-minute gap between the time that Stephen Panic shot a security guard in the hallway and the moment he opened fire on the 22,000 concert goers down below. In a just-released statement, the hotel chain says the rampage began at most 40 seconds after the security guard reported he'd been shot. The implication? By the time hotel security was notified about a gunman, the massive attack was already underway. Campos wasn't the only one who called security. A maintenance man on the same floor did as well. Call the police. Someone's firing a gun up here. Someone's firing a rifle on the 32nd floor down the hallway. The hotel tonight saying Las Vegas police officers and hotel security were already in the building and were dispatched immediately to the 32nd floor. And Matt with us live. Matt, this is a different timeline from what the police have presented. It's wildly different. Now, the Las Vegas Police Department is going to roll out its new timeline tomorrow. But what's so shocking is that 12 days after the worst mass shooting in U.S. history, the police here still can't tell us exactly what happened and when. David. All right, Matt Guppin with us tonight. Matt, thanks. There is still much more ahead on World News tonight this Thursday. New developments in the Harvey Weinstein scandal. The movie producer himself now breaking his silence tonight. What Weinstein is now saying as the list of allegations grows. And what police are now saying here in New York City and in London tonight. The urgent manhunt at this hour. Police searching right now for a person of interest in the shooting deaths of four people, including a young boy. That search now crossing state lines tonight. And a big headline this evening involving Bruce Springsteen, now the boss, someplace else. Tonight, movie producer Harvey Weinstein breaking his silence in front of the cameras. And tonight, from New York to London, what police are now saying. Here's ABC's Lindsay Davis. Harvey Weinstein on camera talking publicly for the first time. Don't follow and don't follow. Don't follow. I'm being good. Since those damning accusations of sexual harassment, assault, and rape. I'm hanging it. I'm trying my best. The video was taken of the 65 year old in Los Angeles on Wednesday. Guys, I'm not doing okay. You're not. I'm trying. I got to get help, guys. You know what? We all make mistakes. Second chance, I hope. According to TMZ, Weinstein then boarded this private jet bound for Arizona, reportedly headed to a rehabilitation clinic. Now police in New York say, based on information and news reports, they're conducting a review to determine if there are any additional complaints relating to the powerhouse producer. And in London, the Metropolitan Police say they're looking into a complaint from someone alleging a sexual assault by Weinstein in the 1980s. 
In an interview with Howard Stern in 2014, Weinstein denied Stern's suggestion that movie producers use their power to get close to actresses. Don't tell me it doesn't work. Howard, that way. I wish it, I wish the, the movies are too expensive, the risks are too great. It doesn't happen that you way. You can't anymore. walk. While Weinstein denies any allegations of non consensual sex, more than two dozen women have now accused Weinstein of harassment, abuse, or rape. Just today, actress Kate Beckinsale wrote on Instagram that she was summoned to Weinstein's hotel where he offered her alcohol. She says she was only 17. He opened the door in his bathrobe, she wrote. I left uneasy but unscathed. A few years later, he asked me if he had tried anything with me in that first meeting. I realized he couldn't remember if he had assaulted me or not. For some of these allegations that occurred decades ago, those would not be able to be prosecuted. But now, in New York and California, there's no longer a statute of limitations for forcible sexual assaults. David. Lindsay, our thanks to you again tonight. When we come back here tonight, more than a half million popular car seats being recalled this evening. Also, more on that desperate manhunt at this hour. Cross to the index, the urgent manhunt across state lines tonight. Police searching for a person of interest in the shooting deaths of three adults and a young boy in a home in Pedro, Ohio. A fifth victim is in critical condition tonight. Police looking for Aaron Lawson, who was last seen running into the woods after crashing his car during a police chase today. Authorities say the victims were related. There is a new consumer alert to hear America Strong, the young couple with so much plans, so much ahead, and the band of brothers who have answered the call. Chris and Britt Harris from Southern Pines, North Carolina, were married almost one year ago this week. Chris, a 25-year-old U.S. Army specialist and member of the 82nd Airborne Division, deployed to Afghanistan. He learned while he was there that his new wife, Britt, was pregnant. She surprised him with this onesie while they were FaceTiming. You're going to be a dad. It was one week later, Chris lost his life to an IED. And while Britt grieved, she also remembered the soldiers overseas, the ones Chris called his brothers. So when she learned whether it was a boy or a girl, she asked his brothers if they would tell the world. Yo, so my boy Harris, you know we're going to do it for him. Proudly making the announcement he would have made himself. I don't know if it was a boy or a girl, zebra or unicorn, but we're going to find out. <laughs> All right? On my count, you ready? Three, two, one. It's a girl, and Britt telling us today she wanted those brothers to be part of this because they were a big part of Chris's life. She plans to name her daughter Christian after her dad, Chris, and Chris's brothers overseas telling the world, we are happy to welcome the new member of our company. And we wish Britt well on that new baby and those brothers. Thanks for watching. I hope to see you right back here tomorrow. Good night.